This is the Jedberg Podcast. I'm the creator and host, Fran Ricciopi. Each episode, I speak with transformative leaders, visionaries, drivers of change, and those dedicated to winning, no matter the challenge. The Jedberg Podcast is founded in the lineage of the special operations Jedberg teams of the past and is produced in partnership with Talent War Group a management consulting and executive search firm focused on helping you optimize the people side of your business. We're sponsored by Jersey Mike Subs. Together, we share the mission of giving, making a difference in someone's life. Visit the Jedberg Podcast, Talent War Group, and Jersey Mike Subs on the web and on social media. A percentage of all proceeds is dedicated to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Fashion dictates our style. It represents our culture. It allows us to express ourselves to be bold and outrageous or reserved and refined. Fashion is a leading indicator of where we're going in society. It sets the trends for how we dress, look, act, and often feel. In fact, the word fashion is defined as a trend or a way of doing something. The fashion industry is ripe with world-famous designers whose creativity and vision have defined both our present and our future. Models are called upon to show us what it should look and feel like. But in order for a designer and a model to change the world, they must first pass through Anita Bin, one of the fashion industry's most iconic leaders and driver of talent. Anita is the go-to casting director for brands like DKNY, Tommy Hilfiger, Bottega, Marc Jacobs, Kate Spade, and Balenciaga. She was instrumental in the rise of Alexander Wang through their 11-year partnership. She is responsible for seeing the designer's vision and translating it into the look and feel of the models who display it. Anita was born in South London. She was raised by foster parents. She modeled as a kid to find her way out of London and a better option than her job at TGI Fridays. For this episode, she invited me to her brownstone on Manhattan's Upper West Side for a chat in her parlor about defining trends, evaluating talent, resiliency in life and business, and raising kids in New York City. They say leaders don't follow trends, they set them. Anita Bitten shows us just how true that statement really is. Anita, welcome to the Jedbird Podcast. Thank you for having me. And thank you for having us in your home here on the Upper West Side. It's absolutely stunningly beautiful here. Yeah, it's been a while since we've had guests, obviously, because we're just coming out of a pandemic. So it's interesting when you have guests because you don't really know how to behave anymore. At least I don't, because I've just spent two years with three people, three dogs, and a cat. So thank you for coming. Well, we had tea, we had coffee. I'd say you did Yeah, 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 I'm I'm learning. (laughs) I'm like, you know, I'm breaking myself in gently though. Yeah. You, and and you, and you stuck with me as I had to set all this equipment up. So I appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for coming. But so fitting to come to New York to talk to you, one of the icons of the fashion industry. New York, regardless of what people may say, that Paris or Milan are certainly capitals of fashion, but New York is up there, uh, right at the top of the list. And to be able to come to New York, sit down with you, talk about fashion, talk about leadership in fashion, and gain your perspective is truly an honor. And it's something that when I woke up this morning at at 4 a.m. to finalize this discussion, it was actually, I'm not going to lie to you, hard for me to think about because there's so many places to start. Your career has been so dynamic, whether it was growing up in South London and coming to New York and finding the way out and then coming here and building a business, which wasn't something that you intended to do. And then really seizing the front end of this industry because when you think about casting in fashion, you have to decide who the next face of these brands is. And as we talk about the Jedbergs and we talk about visionaries, drivers of change, those who have to be transformative leaders, you rise right to the top of that list. Wow, I have goosebumps, thank you. Because when you're living in it and you're a part of it, it actually doesn't sound quite so dynamic. But being that you put it like that, welcome. I'm super excited. (laughs) I can't believe you got up so early. (laughs) Every day, every day, that's what we have to do. I want to start with fashion, though, because how we define fashion, I think, is really important. You cast the biggest names in the industry, Marc Jacobs, Kate Spade, Bottega. You were instrumental in the launch of Alexander Wang. 
the fashion industry in so many ways, it dictates our style, the direction of culture and trends, the tone for where we're going as a society. How do you define the fashion industry and its place in society? Because the rest of us, we just look. Yeah, that's how do I define fashion and its place in, what was the word? Society. In society. Okay, so I grew up in South London and, you know, as an English person, we're very tribal. And we also, we, we, we cult, like, there's a lot of subcultures. So if you think about punk, if you think about teddy boys, there, there's all these subcultures that existed growing up. So for me, fashion was a natural inclination just to be a part of something, really. So the fashion world to me wasn't, I never grew up feeling fashionable, admiring fashion. I wasn't looking at Paris or I wasn't even looking at New York. I was actually very inspired by movies. So when I think about fashion, I think it just sort of, it dictates the era that we've been through. It predicts the future that we're going into. And, and if you think about fashion today, it's really no longer a reflection of the times, be it what you can afford, what you can't afford. It's now, it's such, you know, now we're in a sort of environmental crisis with fashion. So I think along with the world, it's evolved its own problems, its own relevance, and its own role in shaping culture, right? Because right now we've got, we've had enough of fashion. There's a lot of money being spent there's a lot you know so we're looking at ways to make it a nicer place to be whereas in the 80s we all had side ponytails and big rah-rah skirts and we you know it, it just I, I i think as you go through and you grow up fashion means something different but i think today fashion leans into politics it leans into identity it leans into rebellion even and i think it's all you know starts with where we are in the world do designers think like that when designers actually sit down and say, I'm going to develop you know, next year's kind of ideas, you know, like, do they, do they actually tie those themes in? Is that a conscious thing that that's going through their minds? I feel like when you're looking at designers, when you talk about a Marc Jacobs or a John Galliano or designers for designers sake, not H and M, not fast fashion, Yes, you're looking at, you're referring to an artist that has an idea and develops that idea. Be it, you know, I, I think the 90s was grunge, you know, which is all a reaction to what's going on politically, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, right? And from what I know, but I think today's fashion landscape, we're so, um, you know, we're very, we are drowning in clothes. Right. We, there's there's sort of also there's a lot of people making a lot of clothes that we don't really need. Right. So the ones that are actually good with a skill set that understands their customer, what it is they're developing, be it materials, be it an image. Yeah, that's a skill. That's definitely. And I think there is a pause and a thought and then an action. And then I think everyone else just keeps going. You know, we got to keep up. Right. Pants, right. pants, right. pants, right. pants. Hemlines are up. More hemlines up. You know, so so I, I, I think I missed the question. No, no. But That's... I think, you know, fashion essentially is a reaction to what's going on in the world and what's going on politically, financially. And, you know, fashion today, we're just coming out of our pajamas after two years. So there's a lot of... Um, you know, people are redefining who they are, what they are, and what they mean to people. And you've and you've called it subjective. I mean, you said, "quote I see myself as a facilitator. I'm not a star casting person. I think casting is very subjective. My job is as the gatekeeper. We're the, we're there to be a facilitator, an organizer." Unquote. Our podcast focuses a lot on leadership, talent management, human performance are kind of three of our major themes. All of those are subjective in their own right. Several episodes back, we spoke with a psychologist named Dr. Jack Stark, 22-time national champion coach at the collegiate level, at the collegiate level, eight-time NASCAR champion with Hendrick Motorsports. But he defines 
roles within leadership. And there's four of them, a thinker, a promoter, a coordinator, and an action-oriented staff. This thinker, they have the, the vision, the ideas, the promoter champions it, the coordinator is the one who needs to put it together, and then that staff has to actually go out and do it. And I think about that quote from you and how you describe it really as that coordinator role that has to go out and make all of this happen. When you think about the subjective nature of this industry and you describe the level of competition, there's stuff everywhere. What is it about casting that drives you though? Yeah, I think I've always been attracted to people. And when I, you know, I grew up in a very, I grew up in a, in a city, in a big city, and it was a very diverse city. And I am, um, you know, casting, you have a huge responsibility. So, you know, and, and I think you're always informing what people are going to be looking at. So what is an acceptable beauty standard? What is an acceptable, you know, what is an acceptable face? What is an acceptable talent? What is an acceptable... And I, I think there's, it's such a broad strokes area to be working in. Like, what? who's to say I have it right? There's, I, I always tell my stuff, there's no right or wrong answer in what we do. There's just ideas. And if we are working with a client who can really nurture the idea of, you know, Mark Jacobs was one of the first designers to do, he has a makeup, um, a beauty line, and it was, you know, 50 different shades of skin. Well, people have had 50 different shades of skin eternity, since before we were all in existence. And, you know, fashion is able to bring this to the forefront and just to put it in people's living rooms, right. to put it onto people's laps, and to hold people accountable and responsible, actually, you know what, there's something for everyone so that someone's not sitting there feeling marginalized. And I think that is what's important. And every day you make a small step towards making a difference. But for me, just meeting people, just that human connection is really important because as a kid, that is what allowed me to flourish and prosper and know that there was something else for me to do. Because where I come from, people don't really have this trajectory of life. You know what I mean? So I think just sort of the, the basics of casting for me is bringing out the best in the individual, meeting someone that might offer something different to the world or, or their story is that important that I want other people to hear it. Well, I, you said Eileen Ford called it the X factor. And I like how you brought in to the conversation here, bringing the, out the best in people. You and I were joking when we connected a couple of weeks ago that you have to bridge the gap with talent now who's half your age, if not even younger at some point. My, me too. So so I'm up there. We're, we're, we're together. In yeah. this. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> I do this with my athletes that I work with and I look at them at so many times and I'm like, I had a guy tell me the other day, he said, this is the hardest thing I'm ever going to do in my life. And I looked at him and I said, what? That That's impossible. You have no idea. You play a sport and you go to school. That's it. This is, no, you have no idea what's happening when you have kids and a mortgage and a life and all these other responsibilities. How do you bridge that gap? To be honest, this job has never been hard for me. Is that obnoxious? No. It, it's not, you know, I think we talked earlier when you came in, in that when you're doing something that you love so much in a community that is now family, and it's not, I think it's not really about, you know, the, the idea of bridging the gap, this is my life, and it all exists between life, work, personal, family, dogs, friends, it all is one and the same in the sense that every opportunity I get with an individual or a new person or a new intro, that also feeds into my experience, right? So then I travel the world, I meet lots of different people, and it's really important for me to be able to relate to people. So when I think about 
I do deal with 15 year old models, 16 year old models, 23 year old models, 80 year old actresses. And there, you know, there's a certain dynamic that happens between you and a subject when you just allow them to be themselves. And my goal is always to be to help them feel comfortable. Okay. And I'll even say, you know, my job here is to make, you know, help you be the best version of yourself. Let's practice. Let's do this. This is what's expected of you. So it's really about communication, right? But um, I think I don't ever think about it like bridging the gaps. I'm very aware that I'm 20 years younger or 50 years older kind of thing. But I always approach everything and I try to meet the talent where they are, right? And you can tell if it's a 15 year old coming into a large house, a design house, um, they're going to be nervous. And they know that I've done this a hundred times and I could be quite helpful to them. So they're expecting this giant. So you kind of have to shrink to fit, you know, it's sort of one size does not fit all, right? So 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 the so the bridging the gap part is just I think what I would say is meeting the talent where they are. You know, so when you're meeting Susan Sarandon on a Mark Jacobs set and she's just broken her foot. She probably just wants some help, right? right? <laughs> you know, so, so, so yeah. it's sort of not being overwhelmed when you meet your heroes right. and really lifting those kids that just need to feel safe, just need, you know, and, and I think that's in life in general what, you know, when we talk about bridging the gap and just that's what I do in life because that's what was afforded to me always. And the times that it wasn't are actually the times I remember much more clearly than the times that it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, the relationship and building the personal connection is always so important, I think, in anything that we do, especially as we develop leaders, you know, wherever they sit in the organization. I want to ask you about decision making. The military is the greatest organization in the world when it comes to decision making. It's very clear about levels of command, leadership, who gets to make what decision based on certain inputs and where they sit in that hierarchy. Everyone has input. A lot of people, they think, oh, you're in the military, so you just wait and stand there and be wait to told, wait and told what to do and then go do it. And that's really not the case, especially in special operations, because so many times the best ideas don't come from the people at the top. They come from the bottom. And so there's always this bottom-up feedback. And it's actually a really inclusive culture. But what happens after everybody provides their input is that someone's charged with making that decision. And then once that decision is made, everybody has to go out and execute Today, I think that we suffer a lot with discord and some disconnect when decisions do get made that people don't agree with. You said, quote, we can help build the identity of the brand, but we're only part of the decision making process. It can never be more important than the creative director, the stylist, the people that are up there making the final decisions. Un uh, unquote. Your role as you defined it, and as we know, is so critical to the representation of the brand. And you operate in an industry full of probably some of the strongest type A personalities because they have that vision and they see mm -hmm. that vision and it's like, it's kind of like me sometimes with the podcast. Like, I know where I'm going. <laughs> you better get on board, right? But you want to take that input. But as you build these relationships, you build that trust with designers, with the talent, how do you influence the process because you've seen so many things from so many different angles. How do you influence the process and then either get buy-in the way you see it, or if things don't go your way or the way that you've provided input, get everybody to jump on to the decision that's been made? Yeah, I think all decision, like I feel like today what I try to do is that, you know, the idea of, personal responsibility. So every job that I'm afforded, I want to be bold. I want to be informing, not borrowing from the past, but also you have to sort of be able to connect with your client just in the way that you cast people, you have to meet them where they are and really understand where are they and what do they want. And, you know, people are always talking about you know, moving the needle, making a difference. And I think for us, we're very good judges of, do they really want to move the needle? Do they really want to make a difference? And it's 
understanding the language of your trifecta of designer, photographer, creative director. But I think on behalf of them, we have a responsibility to be bold, to have a vision, be it a singular vision in one area of fashion or beauty or and just present ideas that they may not have thought about. And they might look at you and go, that's ridiculous, I didn't ask for that. And my answer will always be, I know, but this is always an option. So I think for us and my company, it's important to always be forward thinking in ideas of beauty, fashion, talent, and, and just the concept of being bold in how things look because you know, I'm not into the idea of generic. It's not interesting to me. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that my definition of generic is the same as yours, right? So, so I think, you know, for us, it's really about making bold ideas and being decisive and being bold. And essentially, that will get filtered and watered down. And we're never presenting something that we can't get behind. And if somebody wants something that I can't get behind, Six out of ten of the times, I will say, this isn't something I can do. I have to tell you, I've never had to say that before. You know what I mean? So I think when you put yourself in, a, in an arena with people that you respect and people that you admire the work that they do, to be a part of that and to be able to inform that is what drives me, right? And then to make bold ideas and bold decisions. If they think it's too bold, that's exciting to me. Do you know what I mean? So it's coming up with things that excite me that might excite them and might interest them. It might be something they didn't think of because when they're relying on you for ideas, that's exciting. When they bring you the ideas, you're like, shit, maybe I'm not doing my job or, you know what I mean? Right. So, so I think, you know, it's really about being bold and being part of the process. And, you know, it's a bit like the, uh, it's a bit like um, the military in the sense that once you're in the field with this bunch of people, you're on board. So let's make this work to the best. Let's do the best job we can do, right? And, and I feel like you can sense if your fearless leader is going in a direction you're not so excited about, then you can push them. And you can maybe introduce ideas that might excite them. You know, but essentially, yes, you get on board with what everybody decides. You said the fashion industry needs disruption. How do you disrupt in the fashion industry? So, well, I think that's it. You gotta be bold. You gotta be oppositional. You have to be defiant to some norms and things that are accepted, right? Like, Americans are blonde with blue eyes. Well, that's not actually true, <laughs> right. right? But it's just like, it, it's just not breaking all. down barriers, breaking stereotypes, but also in the sense that, you know, we, we have a client that, that they do a lot of outdoor advertising on buildings and in swimming pools in Australia. And, you know, they, they sort of disrupted the idea of what's advertising. Well, actually, advertising is anywhere that you can see something, right? So, so I think the idea of being disruptive is so that we don't fall into the mundane. To me, my biggest fear in life is it being working in an arena that is irrelevant and mundane. I'm not interested in either things, you know what I mean? So to, to disrupt it is to be bold, bring new propositions, bring ideas that no one's thought about, do something everyone hates. You know what, at least they're thinking about it. They're not just like breezing by it like nothing's happened. You kind of want a, someone to do a double take at the work that you're involved in. And I think that is important when you're moving the narrative forward, when you're coming up with cultural ideas that could be informing new subcultures, new ways that people dress. Time to wear pink eye, um, eyeshadow with peroxide blonde hair or, you know, just an ideas thing. I want to ask you about where it came from for you. <laughs> Start at, and go back for me. You alluded to growing up uh, for a few minutes and you talked about growing up in South London. You had foster parents who were immigrants to the UK. They worked blue collar jobs. They were different color than you. Right, so they were actually school teachers. Mm -hmm. So I don't, is that considered 
blue collar, maybe. But they, so they were my foster parents. It's an admirable profession, yes, no matter what it is. Absolutely. And you know, I have to confess here, and I hope they'll listen to this. I just was always thinking that's so selfless. Why would anyone want to do that? Because years before, when I was going in and out of foster care, I thought I'm going to be a social worker because that to me is a very admirable profession to this day. And what steered me away from that is that they really don't get paid very much. <laughs> so I was thinking, and it's well, yeah, too. It's well, yeah, that's helpful. A that's a helpful job, but how the hell am I going to get out of here? You know, because I didn't want to stay in South London and I wanted, I wanted to get out. I, I was always, you know, my, my parents were in both immigrants. Um, my foster parents, my, my foster father was, was um, an immigrant, but my foster mother wasn't. But, you know, my, my biological mother was Irish. My biological father was Moroccan. So, so this was, you know, I, I, I know now it was a big influence on how I grew up, but I grew up in South London in the 80s during the race riots. And I went to school and my school reflected where we lived. It wasn't, you know, it was very diverse and... You know, England is based on a class structure. So we just, we were, what's the word? We were delinquents. We had great education. The Brit You know, back then the British education system was pretty epic. I mean, our teachers were amazing. I have one music teacher who has so many awards from the Queen just for his service to children. And that was our foundation because our parents were working. They, you know, we went to latchkey after school. We, we just, you know, we, we raised each other. And I think in doing so, we were complete delinquents. We did things we maybe shouldn't have. And we experienced things that now, and my son would probably consider hardship, but then it was just how we lived, right? So, right. so, so then when we were thinking about fashion, we wanted to stand out. You know, we wanted to go to nightclubs we couldn't afford to get in. There was always a way around it, right? So, so I'm not saying I sort of slipped into a life of crime, but <laughs> I you will say <laughs> there's ways to achieve what you want. And I think when you grow up in adverse circumstances and you have a community that you feel supported by, and that doesn't, I mean, we literally would fight, like physically fight, mm -hmm. which is such an absurd idea to me. And to my son, right? Oh, now, now, now it's just absurd. No. Like we would get beaten by our parents. Like <laughs> now, can you imagine? No. So, so culturally, it was a different time. But when I think about being disruptive, that's all we were. You know what I mean? We signed our names on on. We weren't even graffiti artists. Didn't even look good. We just sort of, you know, would, you know, um, carve our names into trees, sign the back of the bus. You know, I think, but due to we were not overparented. We were given the opportunity. We ran around the city. We jumped on buses. We jumped on trains. And culturally, I think it was a big deal. We liked bands. We followed bands like Aswad, Soul to Soul. We went to clubs on a Sunday afternoon. We went to nightclubs under the arches. Like It was just culturally a very rich experience. Was it safe? Yes, it was safe then. I would die if I thought my son was doing that. But the fact is, is he will have his version of that, right? right? And for us, it was just how we lived. It was really, we were disruptive. And to be honest, we kind of had to raise our voices to be heard, mm -hmm. right? Because we didn't feel very heard. Our parents were like, shut up and sit over there, <laughs> right? That's how, that's how you were parented in the 70s. And we said, okay. And... um Girls don't wear that. Boys don't wear that. And I was like, mm, actually, we can do whatever we want. And that was what I believed. Like, you know, and it wasn't till really I moved to New York that I was like, oh, maybe I can't do what I want. <laughs> but it took into my mid to late 20s to really get to grips with the idea that I was completely able to just do and get whatever I wanted. And I guess for better, for worse, I'm still here. So, <laughs> I mean. Well, you, and you entered into modeling first so as a, as a kid you were yeah. spotted yeah so I my, my my modeling career consisted of I was um scouted by this woman called Barbara Hulanicki who back then was a designer and she had this very famous um company called Bieber so they shot me in this girl Lara Bobroff I don't know what happened to Lara but 
we had a lot of makeup on and we were in all the newspapers and you know one day at school one of my friends not friends one of my classmates I don't even remember who it was was changing the hamster's cage and like smudged hamster poop in my face because I found no. a newspaper <laughs> And I was like, I'm never doing that again. So, 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 you know, I was very young. I, I, for me, it's not a place for 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, because you're very impressionable. Mm -hmm. And it took a big toll on my, like, self-esteem, which I got over very quickly. So this isn't about poor me, but it did expose me to this world that I was like, this is it. I'm getting the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> These people are very cool. Um, I'll never forget Barbara Linnicki's husband, I believe his name was Fritz, but we might have to fact check that. Fact check it. Um, used to drive around in this really flash car and we didn't even get taxis because we got the bus or we walked, right? So it was one of these oh, moments because, you know, you dream about, you know, you, you, you dream about getting out. Whether I, And I believe that to be true of people who grow up not in adverse circumstances like me and I only know it's adverse now, right? Back then, it was just how we lived. Yeah, it wasn't, it was know. just life. And and there was nothing wrong with it, you know? And I, I have no complaints whatsoever. But I think the takeaway is you were driven. You were driven. So I had this opportunity to model. I was actually, I had this huge big head, lots of hair. And I was like, me? Cool, let's do this. You know what I mean? And it was really... An amazing moment and we I got to make money then I would do these weird catalogs I got chucked off a lot of jobs because I was a defiant child this goes back to being a disruptor and I just wanted what I wanted when I wanted it and I have no idea where that came from because my parents were hard-working they were not educated and I don't know where this sense of almost what we would now call entitlement came from but mm -hmm. I never lived with the idea that I was stuck there. I was like, I'm getting the hell out and this is what I'm going to do. So, so from a very young age, I was introduced to photography and I grew to love it. Right? I was a very visual, I'm still a very visual person. I've got a photographic memory and it, was, it changed my life because it gave me something to look forward to. You know what I mean? And I would just pour over the pictures of models and, and, and you know, I was also then toying with the idea of being a ballerina. I was a dancing elephant. Like the only thing I was good at was tap. That's not to say tap is worse than ballet, but I was good at tap. So, you know, I went to a drama school for a hot second and I toyed with all these things that I just wasn't good at. And the problem for me was I wasn't good at not being good, right? Mm. I wanted to be the best tap dancer. <laughs> I was no Bonnie Langford or whatever her <laughs> name is, right? Or Bob Fosse. So I did all of this and I always lived as a teenager, as a kid, as a young model, coming into themselves. I was awkward. I had like, I was really pale, lots of big curly hair. And I just was like, oh, I'm just not good enough. And that was a, a weird idea now that I, now that I have a kid who's 11 and I relate to Jesus, I hope he never feels like that. And then I'm like, well, maybe he should feel like that. Yeah. So, so I'm so Get torn. Get back up there and start studying again. Right, because I'm so torn because, you know, a lot of the successes I had as a teenager was really just blatant, like, hustle. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and and it's funny because, you know, people do say to me, you were a model. And I was like, oh, my God, you're right. Yes, I was. Yes, because now I'm like, Brilliant, but that day when the kid was smudging poop in my face, I said, I'm gonna show you, you know? So we've all got our demons and where we come from, right? But where I came from was just so rich. It was so rich in, I guess, love, but I didn't really know what that meant. You know, we, we looked out for each other. We took right. care of each other. And my friends were excited that I was a model. They're like, holy shit, you? <laughs> like, it was kind of sh as shocking to them as it was to me. And, you know, I loved it, it took care of me. and so. When you look at the trajectory of, you know, model, I got excited about the business, the world of, and that's been my way through. I've, I've constantly been excited. And I have to say, hand on heart, this business has always been good to me, even when it wasn't good. You know, I've always had angels just pick me up and lift me over the, the hurdle or the threshold of the next thing. And that's 
invaluable. And I always, in everything I do, try and give that back in some way. And I think this goes back to where we started of meeting people where they are, be it the talent, be it the client, and be it my own, my staff and my family. And it's sort of a way of life, right? It's not, you don't go to work and behave one way and come right. home and behave another. You integrate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a, a genuineness. Yeah, that, yeah, that totally. That. If you put these different facades on, you know, that, that gets exhausting. You know, if, yeah. for, for people who do that and then they end up in a spot where and I think, I, you know, to some extent I've talked about it on you know, in other conversations where I think I feel like I did that at a period of time in my life. I think we all do you know, at some point where and then you wake up one day and you're like, who am I? You know, like, I, who am I supposed to be in this moment when I walk into this room and you realize I'm exhausted? I should just be me. Yeah. I think about in your in your story. And this, you use the term bold to talk about you know, disruption, but also this bold factor of you growing up and kind of going in and, and having a sense of confidence that, you know, I can do this. It reminds me of our mutual friend, Emily Samberg Gold, you know, who her story in some way is, is similar growing up in Minnesota and then saying, I'm going to go to New York. I don't know anyone in New York, but I'm going to show up. And she, her story we walked into the modeling agency and her picture was on the wall and they're like, we've been looking for you. <laughs> She's like, I had no idea. I just knew I had to come to New York. And so it's, it's so cool when you think about that path that you set on and you had this vision and then you end up here in New York and you go to Ford and jump from now a model into management of models. What was that change like? Yeah, so, so actually I modeled and then I went, I finished high school and then I went to university, but yeah. I worked at a magazine. So I worked at the magazine first. So I worked at this magazine in London, I went to ID magazine, and I did my thesis at university on Terry Jones who owned the magazine. Because while I've never been a fan, I'm not like a music fan or, you know, I don't follow a band or this, I've always been obsessed with the idea of time out, ID, these cultural Bibles that come in, like I would wait for them to come into the store. Okay, when's the next magazine coming out, right? So, so for me, working at ID Magazine was a real fast track into where I wanted to be, who I was, and just that complete acceptance. It wasn't a, vo a, a vogue, mm -hmm. right? It was a cultural Bible of people I knew that existed in the world and we were all living. And I think that is always really important to me because while my life has changed, my circumstances have changed, I have only changed, I would say for the better, in the sense that all the knowledge and the insight these experiences have given me. So I went from, from school to university and when I was at university, I was working at the magazine. Then when I was done with university, I took a job at TGI Fridays in Covent Garden and you, you, you have a, you have a, you know, your, your teammates in TJ Fridays, you wear like jazzy outfits. You what do was jazz your, What hands. was your button? Oh, I had a lot. I had <laughs> a lot many, of buttons. How many pieces of flair? Well, well, I had so much flair, but you also have a responsibility to your team. If you're mm -hmm. not there, they get three extra tables. Right. And, you know, so, so I was still working at the magazine. I, they were on Earlham Street in Covent Garden, which mm -hmm. is, you know, if you look it up on a map, you can Google Maps it. And um, I would run across the piazza every night to TJ Fridays. Then we'd finish work, we'd go to a bar up the street, which was, you know, in England, you'd drink and drink and drink. So so, so this was, this was pre-getting to New York, right? So I then also took a job one summer, at summer camp upstate in Pennsylvania, where I was the tap dance teacher. So now we go right back to right. me being not a great ballerina, but a good tap dancer. So I was like, I'm gonna get to America. So. I go to America to be a tap dance teacher. I was horrible. <laughs> horrible people skills. I mean, honestly, I don't know how I didn't get chucked out. It might have something to do with why I will never send my kid to sleepaway camp. But um, I was the tap dance teacher. Mm -hmm. But every other weekend, we got the weekend off. So we would come into the city and we would meet fashion people or friends. And I met a friend, made a friend, who was a model agent. But fast forward, for the sake of the story, I graduate university, I'm working at TGI Fridays. It's it's a lot of work. Like I'm working every day at the magazine and I call her and I'm like, I really want to move to New York. She's like, oh my God, how did you know? 
I was like, okay, so call me back on this time. Don't forget, right. we don't have cell phones, right? right? Oh, yeah. Call me back on this day at this time. So I call her back. She's like, I'm leaving the agency I work at. I'm going to another agency, which is next. And we need an assistant on the women's board. And I was like, assistant? No way. <laughs> so she's like, oh, my God, they'll totally give you the job. And I was like, ah, I don't know. Where is it? Oh, it's in Soho, New York. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm there. So Sounds perfect. I still don't have a resume. And I'm like, maybe I don't need one. I'll just call them. <laughs> so I call up one of the owners. I, I, this is how I remember it. So, And they say, when can you come? And I say, two weeks. And they call me back with a flight. And I fly there to New York. I fly here. This is it. Uh -huh. And I go to and I meet them. And they basically give me the job. So three weeks later, I pack a bag. And I move to New York City. And that was really the start of it. So it was quite organic. And then I was an assistant at this modeling agency, which, yes, you're right, I had been a model, but I was 11. I'd also worked at a magazine with no budgets. Mm -hmm. So I get there and I'm like, what is going on? And it was pandemonium. We, again, we go back to being in high school. So you, the people I work with, one of the people I worked with then, I still work with now. So that's 1994, mm -hmm. 1995. Um, Calvin Wilson he and I worked together to this day and it was a real fast track into the fashion world as the world knew it for me I was very closeted in my English idea of subcultures we dress up we do this I work at ID magazine we work with these photographers and all of a sudden these photographers were the photographers right. and I was like oh I know them so so you know, culturally, the Brit thing became a big thing, and I was perfect timing and had a great accent, which in New York now, everyone has an accent like me. There's a lot of them, but back then, there weren't <laughs> there so many. Wasn't really. So it really worked to my advantage. So going into the idea of management, back then, was people took it seriously. It was big business, right. and a lot of my mentors came from that agency, and I can say two of them are like two of my ride-or-die best friends to this day. So we're talking decades mm -hmm. and while it was a huge departure from what I was used to I knew I was meant to be there right. I was never like what the hell am I be doing here so again it was part of that oh, I got this they're like well, do you know this I'm like not really but let's give it a go right, right. so so I, I think again just really the idea of being in the right place at the right time but also being supported by the right people and being given the platform to be able to be the best version of yourself. There I was, and they provided me with all of that. So then, you know, I decided it was time to move on. I had another job to go to, who also then helped me in the next step. So, so there was never a point where I was, I, it was just a lot of, I had great access from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. I think having an English accent in New York City was a huge help. And it also helped that I was hugely social and clearly had an agenda that I was unaware of, right? I was like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I just kept moving. I, I, I don't know if mentally my health, you know, I'm sure I could have been a bit nicer to myself, but New York keeps going, so you keep up with it. And I was up for the challenge. And then you had no intention necessarily to start your own business. Absolutely not, no. I mean, that just sounds like too much responsibility. But, but you also said that you weren't a very good employee. So, so what I will say, I was a very good employee to the fact that I turned up every day. Right. And when I was there, I'm like a ride or die. If I'm, if I'm on a job even to this day, we're in it. Mm -hmm. We're in the trenches. We're going to get this done. We're going to be the best at it, right? But, you know, there's just some things that I, you know, it's, it's growing up anti-establishment. Mm -hmm. I wasn't used to it. I wasn't used to rules. I didn't grow up in a nuclear family. We never really had dinner around the table. Well, actually, my foster parents did. But at this point, I'm a teenager. So I'm like, oh, this is so lame, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so, so there's no, in my life, in my early 20s, there's no convention. So the right. idea of, like, meetings, why? I know best anyway. Why would I even listen? So there was a lot of very, just an obnoxious 20-something who was being given a lot of attention because they have an accent and mm -hmm. they have a passion for all of this, like real passion. Like I loved models, I loved fashion, and I loved 
the idea of ooh going to the shows and it was all very exciting to me right but when I said that I wasn't the best employee it's because I wasn't so teachable but what I understand now is I was really listening so even though I wasn't like, okay we're going to do it this way I'm like eh, maybe I want to do it this way you know maybe I was just being you know contrary I don't know but I, I, I definitely look back and I'm so grateful to all my teachers and I definitely heard them you know and I carry a lot of it with me and I'm so grateful for that and for the mistakes right because when people hold you accountable mm -hmm. for for your actions and maybe you haven't done the right thing you're like oh wow I would never have even thought that so I think you know part of that growth period was making mistakes and being corrected on them and that was the good part about being an employee. The other part was I was desperate to do everything, but I also didn't really have such bad ADD. I, sitting down and making a resume, the, the, the letters just kept falling off the page. I also wasn't... That's like one of the worst things to do. Yeah, and I also wasn't aware of... I didn't have much self-esteem when it came to it. Yes, I could hustle and yes, I could sell ice to Eskimos, but... When it came to it, I probably wasn't as comfortable with myself. There was a lot of work to do. There was a lot right. of personal work to be done, right? Um, so, so yeah, so I was a very loyal employee, but I was definitely better in business alone because I could make my own schedule, I could break the rules, and I had only really myself to answer to when I screwed up. And in 2015, you met Alexander Wang, which then provided you an opportunity. Yeah, so I had always been given opportunity, right? And it came in the form of, you know, I have mentors. Like one of my mentors, I would consider a gentleman called John Pfeiffer, um, who was like, I do this great job. I'm very busy. Would you like to do it? And I was like, really? Yeah, would love to. Um, you know, there was... There was people, there was a producer called Rudy Pietro who worked at an ad agency who would hire me. You know, I worked with The Gap for 10 years before I did any sort of high fashion. Like, and, and people that did the job that I do now, I really looked up to and respected, but I didn't really consider that as an option, right? I was thinking, I love what they do, but this is what I'm going to do. So, um, you know, I had, my friend had, was going to be a um, marine biologist. He decided he'd take pictures. I decided I'd find his models for him. And it was, you know, a very, it was an amazing build. It was like we, we worked it out as we went along, right? And, and then when I met Alex, I had enough experience. I had the opportunity to work in Paris. I worked with Victor and Rolf and Hussein Shlyan and really designers that you, they're admirable. They're genius they're all that stuff and you're like wow you learn what goes into it right and then when I met Alex he was straight out of school and we were both equally as excited I'd had a bit more experience but we were driven by the same things which was the imaging the idea of growth to be a part of this fashion landscape that we aspired to be a part of and you know if I think about it what was that I'm not really sure but, you know, we just wanted to push to move the needle. And I, I believe in the 11 years, we really did. And we had some great, great, great success. Well, it's funny because some of the things that you said was that you were allowed to make mistakes and apologize for them. And you weren't kind of put into this box. And you could, you said you, you were allowed to turn up hungover, fall asleep in meetings. You could go to Berlin, jump naked into the swimming pool. All the stupid things that you get to do as a kid is how you framed it. Because as you describe it here, you got to do, you, you, had, you shared the vision. Mm -hmm. you know, and when you have a partner, when you build something and you share that vision, but you also understand your role. Seth Goldman, we had, who's the, the chairman of the board at Beyond Meat, founded Honest Tea, uh, talked to us about this. That you can have people who are equally brilliant in their worlds come together and build something that changes an industry and changes the world when you understand your role. I think about that when, when you tell that story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much joy in the journey, right? There's so much joy in the mistakes because you learn. There isn't one mistake that I'm not like, 
I'm like, oh, God, it's my life's <laughs> over. You're like, okay, so how do we do it next time? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you said something that I wrote down, and I really like it. You said, quote, there's no fast track to success, even on social media. And then you referenced some folks, Kendall Jenner, Nicole Kidman, Paris Hilton's mother, and I would argue also Paris Hilton, on folks who've done a tremendous job leveraging social media, building their personal brands. And a lot of people, I think it's easy to think that, well, they just woke up and they started posting on Instagram and all of a sudden, you know, they made a billion dollars and it's because they posted a couple of things, but they forget that there's a lot of work that goes into that and it's admirable work. And Paris Hilton has come up in a lot of conversations we've had because I'm trying to get her on the show. Because <laughs> so, Mitzi Perdue was someone we had, it was the, her husband was Frank Perdue, her dad was the founder of Sheridan Hotels. And she wants to meet her. And so I told her one day I'm gonna make that happen for Mitzi, but an incredible, incredible person. My question to you about this is that social media has changed the world in so many ways, but specifically it has changed the fashion industry and it's changed the way that you have access to talent it, much different than you did in the past. Can you talk about social media, how you've leveraged it and how it has changed the industry? Yeah, so I think, you know, every, I, there's a lot of pushback to social media, right? They're like, oh my God, they're like a it girl, social media star, da, da, da. Like, I think when you pause and you look at something, you have to really look at what is it good for, what, what is it doing good and what is it doing bad, right? You look at the pros and the cons of everything. And I think for me, I was lucky enough to work pre-social media, hence all those stories that you just brought up, which are hysterical because now I'm so proud of them, <laughs> like jumping naked in a room. My son would die. Like, you know, we were able to live our life on life's terms, right? And I think now there's a certain degree of how we manage ourselves, how our kids will have to manage themselves and, and what they have to be comfortable doing, which isn't running through the streets naked. They won't get into college. Do you well, know what I mean? Everything so, lives. So, now. so, so everything away. has a, has, it, it goes on. It, it, it develops a life of its own. So, so I think that the, the benefits of social media is it can be really a rich tapestry of access. You know, I have regularly on my Instagram contact with like age, like agents in the Africas, like agents in North Africa, agents in parts of the world in Asia that you didn't even know existed, right? That, that we, we have like this huge conversation with so many different people, right? And we get to an insight into people's lives. I think the, 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 you know, the opposite side is the bullying, the false expectations, the unrealistic beauty standards, the, you know, there's sort of, it's about the, the finite line of what is, where's the entertainment value? And I, I, I think always, that there's definitely a part of society that just wants to put people down, that just wants to put, like, it's always going to be there. It's always been there, but now they have a platform, right? And I think there's also that part that this is completely valuable. So then we have to look at our emotional intelligence and how we deal with this, because I can't answer everybody that comes to me and wants to be a model, right? But you have to give everyone, if you're responding to one person, you have to give everyone you have to meet them where they are. I'm going to speak to this woman. She's responded to my friend. She's going to respond to me. So you're constantly setting yourself up to be criticized, right? And, and I think the idea of social media, we did a campaign with Mark Jacobs, which was Cast Me Mark, where the individuals took their own pictures and posted them. And it was a great exercise. You know, I can name... You know, I know Hari Neff was one of the... Um, what was one of the people shortlisted on that particular um, that particular campaign and and I, I I think there's access you get access right people get access to you you're able to share your wealth with so much with a much bigger worldwide community and I think in that sense it really is a huge benefit to the fashion world they, they can sell on mm -hmm. Instagram there's there's sort of you know, there's smaller companies that just exploded during the pandemic who are able to communicate with their customer 
on Instagram, right? But, but then I think what happens is when you talk about a legacy brand or luxury brands, you have to walk that fine line between what is luxury and what is, you know, small boutique fashion. You know, when people like buy local, well, what right. is local? We don't know because we, when you look at something, they've got 3 million hits on Instagram or the world is confused. I'm confused. I'm confused by metrics, by numbers, <laughs> by pants, by those pants, by these pants. Like, I think there's so much margin for error in all of it, right? And then you look at people like Kendall Jenner and the fact is, is that is a, a, a young woman now who was born into the world of entertainment, who decided that she wanted to be a model and did a really good job at it. Through all the criticism, through, you know, everybody, everybody's gaze, everyone had an opinion, even if it was positive or negative, you know, same with like, you know, Bella Hadid, like they, they've all opened themselves up to criticism, but there's not one of those girls that you've mentioned that does not, or women, sorry, that does not work their butts off. Right. One, to work, two, to be creative, to make images, to, to, to sort of supply the world with what we're looking for, and three, to protect themselves, because they are absolutely opening themselves up to criticism daily and I don't know how they do it I really don't and people find the littlest thing too oh it for sure have to be a big deal. and also you know I think when you think of someone like Kendall she was already in people's gaze right so now she comes into a world that that used to be so it was like a you know there was no access you had to be a certain high a certain you know and now it's opening up and she's good at it and people like her and guess what that's opening you up to criticism. So I think, you know, the idea of social media has opened up our worlds. And as novices and been in this business for a long time, we have to be flexible and we have to look at what, why it's a good tool and why it's a bad tool and help people decide how it can be good for them or how it can be bad for them. But it's not about dictating, oh yeah, I don't do that or you should never do that and this has changed the way we look at it, it's just life. We've evolved, right? It, it's just a right. fact of each day where we don't all get wisdom teeth anymore. You know what I mean? It's like evolution. It's not, it's not, I think it's just a fact. I think probably goes back to, I don't want to live in the past. That's done. I did that. Yes, that was fun. Oh my God, I remember, still remember the headache. Actually, I want to look to Who's inspiring me from these young people, these old people? What is your message about the environment? Because I don't know about that. Should we recycle or should we not recycle? You know, I mean, this, I have some very basic needs and wants from people. Like, ooh, tell me more kind of thing. But I think social media has expanded our landscapes and has improved our relationships with other people in the sense that we have access. And then what you do with that is how you mold and treat people. And again, it goes right back to, you want a, people to be the best version of themselves, right? Well, in this industry too, has a lot of ups and downs. I think you see it, you know, <clears throat> trends run out, styles change, people don't look the part that you need anymore for the direction that a brand is going. I think we've seen also the highest highs and the lowest lows in this industry. And there's massive riches, you know, I think of a, L brands and Les Wex, Wexner and the yacht that they have that sits in Newport in the summers is ridiculous. But then you see, like you just alluded to a little bit about it on social media, the, the scandal and the smear campaigns and this nasty side of things and it exists in, in politics in a lot of different places. You said that you can't have expectation in this business, that you have to feel lucky to be present that sometimes it's not always about performance and you can't take it too seriously. How do you define and think about resilience in this industry? And what's your advice to those who, whether they want to be a designer, whether they want to be in talent management or they want to be in casting or they want to be a model. When you, you look at the industry as a whole and somebody comes and says, I want to make it here. What's your advice to them? So in the fashion industry, like it, it's like any industry, it's, it's entertainment, right? But you also, I would always just 
if you my advice would be if this is something you're passionate about work out which areas you can excel in right because just like an olympic athlete or nicole kidman she's very you know you have to you have to really work on your craft right you have to you have to be present you have to turn up knowing that you are part of a big team and your input is valuable and maybe not even in that moment right and you turn up i think the secret is you turn up and when i say just be present i think the expectation is you're not turning up to be the star right that's kind of maybe where i should have taken that statement i think you turn up and you learn and you you find people who are maybe like-minded or have interests that you have or that you admire and and you know there's a lot to be said about mentorship or you know but i don't think again it goes back to the idea of fast tracking there is no fast track if you know if you have a lot of knowledge about your area of expertise then use that like a doctor like a heart surgeon only really works on the heart but they know about everything else right so for me i love casting i can totally tell you how an atelier in a big design house works i can i can tell you a lot about photography and lighting but my area of expertise is casting and that's organizing to get the people there to work out what will be the most efficient way how to introduce ideas that they'll be well received and i think the idea of Resilience isn't about taking a job for no money. It's about knowing your next five moves, right? It's like a chess game. Okay, so I can do that, get that, to do this, to do that, but I'm still waiting on tables at TGI Fridays and going home smelling like burgers on the night bus, right? Right. And oh, it's just yeah. about strategic moves. It's not about, for me, in my opinion, it's not about, there's, you're never gonna turn up and be the CEO. Right? Yeah, not on it, day one. Not on day one. You're never going to turn up and know how to do an Excel chart. I still yeah. struggle with it. So <laughs> so it's about learning how to, you know, you as a kid, you learn, okay, I've got to wear socks, then I put on my shoes, then I do up my laces, then I put on my underwear, then my pants. If you forget the underwear, you're screwed, okay? So if you can relate to just the simple tasks in life, when you get to an organization, which was so out of my realm of understanding when I got to New York City, and I was in these big offices with everyone had a big title, you can sort of work out that to get from A to Z, there's got to be a lot of high highs and low lows. And I think, you know, the high highs are the moments that you celebrate success in your job. You get to where you wanted to be. And that's not because you expected that. It's because it was on your timeline of how you were getting over here, right? So, so there's always has to be a big picture rather than a short-term solution, right? And I think when you think about fashion, everyone is like, glamour, this and that. But I think there's not one person you could say to me that was like, just stepped in and was an overnight success. And I would put money on it. And I think that's because you have to have the resilience and the rigor and the just the ability to turn up. And you know, there's there's the, I don't know if I can swear, but there's bullshit, or you can edit that out. You know, there's <laughs> no, challenges really. and hurdles <laughs> in every job, right? You work on Wall Street, you work at a bank, you work in catering, in the service industry. Like, it's really not as different. You just don't really need qualifications. Like, right. you know, it's not like being a heart surgeon or being in the army. You just need to like turn up and you know hope for the best <laughs> <laughs> and, and have a goal, right? There was a period of time or a perspective where people thought that models have a shelf life and that after a couple of years, that's it. But we have seen so many models go on to build tremendous careers with a tremendous amount of longevity. Who's doing it right? Well, I think with when you think about career span, you're talking about individuals, right? So my career has lasted this long in this many different forms. Yours, you've had many different, and you're like an overachiever, right? Like, 
And you can say, well, I did well, that. My, my wife doesn't think so. She doesn't? Okay. On paper. It reminds me every day. On, on paper, you're totally an ago. overachiever. And I think <laughs> it comes down to the individual, right? So the, 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 the biggest problem with entertainment, be it acting or whatever it is, is the rejection, right? So when you can turn the idea of being rejected from those photographers don't like me, guess what? They, they don't like a lot of people, but it's okay. I think that there is a certain amount of learnt growth, intellectually, age. You know, we're aging and we're evolving. And as an individual, if you think about the career trajectory of like Naomi Campbell, um, Karen Alston, Guinevere Van Sinus, all models that have consistently worked, but have potentially taken time off to do art, philanthropy, whatever they have decided, I think with anything, when you have, you, you cannot be so singular about one thing because that is what is going to disappoint you. So there always right. has to be the idea that you have something else. And it doesn't have to be if you're a woman, it doesn't have to be kids or a family. Or, it's whatever you want it to be, right? So for me, it was always the idea of a family, right? But then I had one kid and I was like, whoa, that's a lot more than I can handle, right? So, so, so my idea of having 20 kids wasn't on the cards, but there are points where you ebb and flow. And I think the, you know, the idea of a shelf life that just takes away from the absolute talent and rigor and inspiration that these models bring to its set, right? Because people are like, oh, they're just pretty faces. Well, that's actually not true. And, and I know that because in order to turn up, liaise with 20 people, hair, makeup, producers, look at like onlookers, um, photography, creative director, that's a team. It's like being on a movie set. And I think, you know, it, it's been said, models don't have the same protection. They don't have the same, you know, they're not revered as much for their skill as they are for how they look, right? And I think you can totally, the life of a model is almost as big as they want it to be because if they can keep reinventing themselves and the idea of themselves they just have to stick with it there has to be some rigor in their you know in their story and they have to take time for themselves in order to rebuild right so so i think some people's expiration day is self-inflicted and others it's maybe it's not the world they want to be in. Like it is, you know, it's it's competitive, like a competitive sport, like being an actress or an actor, like, you know, you're not a teacher. There's not there's no rules, right? There's no you're not a lecturer or a social worker. Like you literally are turning up, and you have to perform daily. And there's an expectation that you'll perform at a high level. Yeah, and if you yeah. don't, it's like, ugh, what happened yeah, to her right. or to him? But, <laughs> you know, I, I think the, the idea of a shelf life, I think with everybody and everything, is you got to take control of your own. It sounds like so corny, but if you're not make, telling me, oh, yeah, I'm going to be around for the next 10 years, then I'll be like, okay, she probably doesn't want to do it anymore. Who the hell would? Right. It's a lot of work, right? So... I, I think all those self-imposed restrictions and shelf lives come from the individual. And I do believe that there's a journey and you've only got to look at Lauren Hutton, who I, apparently is 81, who I happened to be at dinner with the other night and was blown away because she's still the Lauren Hutton people talk about. For, like, she's amazing. She's a force. And she's a superstar. Right. And whether and whether the, the 22 year olds at the table knew who she was or not, she let them know. Right? right. So I think these are all, you know, the idea of personal growth, personal responsibility and just taking charge of where you want to be next, what you want to do and who you want to be to the world with your public persona. Luckily, that's not something I have to really consider. But I think for a model, that's a big thing because these kids are plucked out at a very young age and they grow up in front of the camera and their bodies change in front of the camera and they have to redesign who they are in front of the camera, right? So um, I, don't, I, I don't know if I totally believe the idea of a shelf life, but I believe there is a self-imposed thing that's like, I'm too old to be a model. But then you go on and go do something else. Yeah, then off you go. Yeah. We, we spoke 
a bit about kids. You you talked about your son who's 11. Before we started, you and I were, were talking about my kids at two and 12. And I wonder as you think about the development of the next generation, both in the industry professionally and personally, is there the same sense of resiliency, adaptability? We've, we've talked about grit in almost every episode that we've had this year on the podcast. Does it exist the way that it used to? Because I, I tell you, I work with, with a number of different athletes and you know, we struggle with this. And I think COVID didn't help because it took so many people out of their zone and it put them in this kind of protective bubble and it said you know we got to remove all the adversity in your life and for a year plus people kind of lived in there and then now it's like okay we'll get back out there and not only you're going to get back out there and you know live your life but now you have to perform and you have to perform at a high level whatever it may be you think that in the development of the younger generation we are creating this aura where adversity doesn't exist and and if so how do we correct that well there's several ways of approaching this question, right? Because I think there are people... It was people, a loaded question. Yeah, but I think there are people <laughs> living through absurd... Um, you know, they, they, they lack the general resources just to live. Their adversity is undeniable. And that's not that's not my experience with my son, right? My son is... he He's, you know, born into a very privileged existence, which for me, I really... I struggle with not because I don't want him to have things I didn't have right but I do you know I'm constantly questioning and we talked about this earlier like everyone gets a medal I'm like yeah but not everyone won right like dude you didn't win give the medal back like so so I think so so I think for, from where my son is right the, the idea of adversity is his experience with it is very limited but I think we have a responsibility to not remind them and I don't really come up with that when I was a kid right I think it a lot but but I I, I think you just the the idea of personal accountability with an 11 year old it is is something that is always on the tip of my tongue like what do you mean like you got more Pokemon card like you know so 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 for me as a general question I think I believe and this might be a little bit controversial but I feel like our children today are overparented and I am also guilty of it right but I've become harshly aware that bringing a kid up in New York City they have to that there's just codes that need to be that they need to be aware of right and also you have to hold them accountable and honestly not everyone's a winner they're just not going to be but also understanding why there's not room for 500 million winners because how do we get everything done right and you're not always at the top of the totem pole in everything you do but guess what if you're committing to it you're going to finish it you're going to see it through to the end an example is my son is a horrible dancer there i said it <laughs> he'll have it he, he you know we won't tell him. but he's in an arts program and he's very blessed to be a part of it because you know, it's, it's the Harlem School of the Arts, and they are, their teachers are incredible. He did not miss one class, right? Neither did the teachers during the lockdown. He was a terrible dancer. The teachers stuck by him, and you know what? He turned up every week, and he did it. And then at the end of it, he said, I know I wasn't that, you know, I, I know I wasn't the best in the class, but I got much better, right? right? And that was the message yeah. she gave him, and I can only sort of, you know, the, the, the idea of adversity, I'm very blessed that my son's experience with it are limited because mine weren't. And I know I'm not blind. I watch the news. There's The world is in a terrible state. But we need thinkers that are, we need creative thinkers. We need people that will be able to think outside the box. And that's what I want to bring to my kid, right? And guess what? You can use your position to do good in the world you can recognize you know the 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 part that you play in it and i think this is all very important we've all had some very good lessons that almost came a bit late to a lot of people but you know i think 
parenting is just a reflection of how poorly you do in the world, right? Because they just point out all your flaws. <laughs> Every day. Like, yeah. and, and all of a sudden, I'm like the most uncool human to my son, who has always thought I was pretty cool, right? And I, I sort of indoctrinated him into, I'm really cool, right? And so he told me, yeah, mom, so a lot of my friends at my school, because he goes to this new school, um, they their parents work in fashion, and you know, they're always really excited when I tell them what you do. And I said, well... What do I do, Hunter? And he said, well, your job is very critical. And I was like, wow, yeah, cool. Okay, like an ER doctor maybe? And he's like, he looked at me like, since totally sincere 10-year-old at the time. And he went, no, mom, you criticize a lot of people. <laughs> and and that sort of like, you know, that sort of, sort of summed it up. I was like, wow, okay. I mean, do you say that though? And, and I just thought, you know, from his mouth to, to you know, mm -hmm. to, to up there. It's just, it's, it's, we're constantly reminded of our shortcomings through our kids, right? And I, I think that is the joy of being a parent. It's definitely not for everybody. For me, one is certainly more than enough. And I have a good kid. And you know what? One of my, my foster mother told me, darling, you get what you can handle. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, never a true word said. I can just about handle this force of an 11-year-old who is all about his rights and all <laughs> about doing the right thing and all about this isn't fair. And I just sit there in awe of him because, you know, I, I, I'm excited that he is confident enough to bring this into the world. And I encourage it as I sit there like, well, we would never have got away with that when I was a kid and blah, 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 blah. But he doesn't have the opportunity to run through Central Park spray painting walls and, sh you know, showing his butt to the moon. I don't know. Like, he has to be very careful in all of his actions. And we're not at the phone stage yet or the social media stage. But these kids, we, we, we sort of, we're trying to raise kids that are socially, environmentally aware. And, you know, it, it's a challenge. It's not, um, there's not, again, one size fits all. It's daily pivot being flexible and just putting your hands over your ears and just hoping it goes away, right? But I, I think, um, yeah, I love being a parent, but it's not for everybody. And, and, and nor do I recommend it for everybody. I think, think, think wisely. <laughs> yeah, I'm the 12-year-old the girl and it's every day is a new experience where I just stare and I say, whoa, yeah, like, this, is, this is happening, like this is real. Uh, I'm so I'm so nervous about the next couple of years. Can I ask you about your Spotify playlist? Yeah, which one? Well, the one that is entitled "Change Is Inevitable, Progress Is Optimal." Oh, for um, Mark Jacobs. Yeah. Yeah, let me look at that. That one is. Did you really like it? Good. Oh. <laughs> so I I found it in my research. Let me see. I'm gonna find it. I'm... Yeah, if you have to you have to put your name in the Spotify okay. search engine. Put your name. All and right. I think if you put changes inevitable, it'll start to come up. But I'm sure it was like Northern Soul. No, it's all over the place. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a disaster, like me. Well, so it's I like actually really appreciated mess. it it's because people say to me, you know, people ask me, well, what kind of music do you like? I'm like, I don't know. It depends on my mood, and. It is so fitting in that it is this compilation of all different types of music. And I would encourage anyone listening to this to go find it on Spotify because it really is about your mood and how do you feel. And you can find a number of songs in there. There's like 41 or 42 songs. But now that we've had the chance to have this conversation, it is so fitting for you now that I've gotten to know you. I really thought it was you're like she's definitely a lunatic. I don't know what's on it. I can't find it. Okay, I can only imagine if I was gonna do one today, it would be like Soul to Soul. I'd have a lot I think that's of like on. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like my favorite band ever. Aswad possibly. Um But like Lionel Richie's on there. Oh yeah. It's like it's <laughs> it um was great. It, it's I can't find I know I, I did Eminem. it for a mark ja Oh my god, he's like the master. <laughs> Um, I know I did it for Mark Jacobs during the lockdown, right? Mark Jacobs, was, Spotify, Anita Bitten, let's see. But I think, too, you know what? I, I, I think, oh, here it is. I got it. I got it. Let's see. Maybe later. Okay, Shalimar. Well, this is my youth, right? Shaka Khan, Lionel Richie, 
Santi Gold, I happen to meet and work with, with Alex Wang. So she, I'm a huge fan. Soul to soul, humanly. I mean, it's all like makes sense, doesn't it? Um, Dust Racist. Actually, my son introduced me to that song mm -hmm. and I really liked it. MIA, she's like a master. Nana Cherry, she was my childhood dream girl. Like I wanted to be Nana Cherry. I, I just thought everything about her, she was so cool. And she was on the scene in London and she was sort of like with the fashion people like Ray Petrie and that whole Buffalo movement. And I was like, she is very cool. Blondie, I mean, mm, needs classic. no introduction. Fleetwood Mac, my favorite. Dreams is my favorite song ever. The Rolling Stones, I'm not such a big fan, but I do like Emotional Rescue. Mm -hmm. And when I told my partner this, he said, well, of course you like that. It's when they got into pop music or something. <laughs> so, 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 you know, he is a big, like, um, he's a big music guy. Kendrick Lamar. I, none of this stuff really, Africa Bambata, like that's, we, we, we listened to this stuff in high school. Um, it's all stuff you can sing to, right? Yeah. I, like, I like to sing to stuff. Harry Styles, I mean, who doesn't like it? It's a bit like saying, <laughs> it's a bit like saying you don't like, um, oh God, what's his name? Spider-Man, the new Spider-Man. Oh, um, I, I forget who the new Spider-Man is. Oh my God, how can we forget? So my claim to fame is Tom Holland. Tom Holland. I will sit there for hours watching videos of Tom Holland and Zendaya <laughs> because I just think they have the cutest thing because he's like five foot two and they love each other. Mm. Like that to me is when social media is positive because it's yeah. like, oh, we have a positive role model for our kids. Wow. Yeah. And, and there's he's, a community around it. He's just fab. He's like this. So he went to school at Wimbledon College and I went to Ursuline Convent and they're like parochial sister church schools, right? So I like feel this weird connection, like we're almost friends. I'm just kidding, even though I'm older than his mom. But, but you know, I think, hence Harry Styles, Sublime, Shirley Bassey, that was when I was really little. Grandmaster Flash, Paul Weller. I think it's all, makes real sense to me. I'm like a little confused when it doesn't uh, sound like that. No, right? I, 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 I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think they're all my favorite things all in one. Yeah. I listened to it the whole way here, Alfred. I listened to it the whole way. Yeah. <laughs> I recommend it. And I love Harry Styles. What's not to love? <laughs> well, Anita, as we close out, the Jedbergs in World War II had to do three things as core foundational tasks every day to be successful. They had to be able to shoot. They had to be able to move. They had to be able to communicate. If they did these three things with the utmost precision, then they could actually focus their effort, their attention on big picture problems. What are the three things that you do every day in your world to be successful? So I, you know, I wake up early just by nature of having a school age kid. And, you know, I, this wasn't mentioned and because it's not important, but I am 18 years sober. Um, so having done a, you know, through a 12 step program, I do a gratitude list, one before bed and one in the morning because it changes in my sleep, believe it or not. I also meditate and I also walk my son to school. And those three things, I do most of those before I look at my emails. And if I don't, my emails are usually probably curt or or I hope this finds you well. Right. No. <laughs> or as I mentioned before, Whereas after that, you, you know, they're real tools for me just to center and get some space and just get, in, get to grips with my ego that might get in the way of my day, which is really the biggest thing that trips me up because it's not my willingness or my excitement or my interest in something. It's really my ego that stops me from doing things. And I think the idea of gratitude is, is something I didn't grow up with. I mentioned it earlier. I didn't care. And I think it's really important because I'm so fucking grateful. I'm going to say it again. I'm so grateful without the F word. <laughs> and, um, I'm just so grateful for the journey and to have been allowed to do this, right? To allowed to do all of it, allowed to do this podcast that you actually think it might be that interesting and that it might actually help someone. Because at the end of the day, a lot of people, it's if we're not in service, what are we doing, right? And I think that's an important message for everyone and not everyone's going to get it but i get it now and that's important to me so yeah i set myself up for success each 
day. And you know where I learned that setting you up for success was at TGI Fridays. It's true. Yeah, they, they, you know, you have to go into it with your eyes open, with your calm, with your center, and just communicate. And I think that's, those are my tools so far. Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. I, I worked at Friendly's, which is, it is like Cheesecake. scaled down. Um, Cheesecake? They're the ice cream. Oh, right, right, ice cream. okay, yeah. And I worked at California Pizza Kitchen. Yeah, yeah. And you do, you take so much from those. I worked at a pharmacy, was my first job at the cash register. And you take so much from those things. Gratitude, meditate and walk your son to school those are great three and we didn't discuss the 18 years sober and congratulations on that and that is a feat in in and of itself yeah and and to be honest it doesn't the, the reason i you know it's not something it doesn't define me but it, it is something that the idea of a you know it just asks for help that's all you're in, in everything, like even if you don't need to get sober, I think what we miss in our communications with people is I'm having a shitty day and I need help. You know what? Don't worry about it. I got you. Or you got to pull your socks up and get it done. So let's get through this and then you can you can have a heart attack at the end, right? So so there's there's sort of there is a solution for every problem. It's just how you decide to get there. And now I choose an easier, softer way, right? And and that's, you know, again, personal choice. And I hope that what I'm putting out in the world is as positive as I intend it to be. And, and that would be my goal, right? Well, one of the things that I say a lot is, it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. But you gotta tell someone. Yeah. You, know, you don't have to beat yourself up. We spend a good amount of time talking about suicide and suicide awareness and you know when have you pushed yourself to the limit whether it be mentally emotionally physically where you are waking up and you're saying that you know i don't know if i can keep doing this then that's okay to to accept that and come to grips with it identify a path talk to someone get help it doesn't even need to be help just go find someone and talk to them yeah and then and find the path out of it find the solution as you said um it's like certainly easier said than done absolutely but there is always a solution yeah yeah especially if you exhibit the, the drive we talk a lot about drive yeah the nine characteristics of special operations is a grounding factor here in in the podcast and we invoke them really in every episode and you know how do we actually recruit assess select talent and then how is that applied to whatever the industry is, drive, resiliency, adaptability, humility, integrity, curiosity, team ability, effective intelligence, emotional strength. You named so many wow. of them. I think you named oh all God, of them. Oh my God, will you give me a job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. So it was funny because normally yeah. in, in these, I do invoke them a lot during yeah. the conversation and you did, I think, all of them for me and I didn't have to, which is a pretty cool, pretty cool um, facet of this episode. But... High performers exhibit all of these, not necessarily all at once, but certain proportions of, of some at certain times, depending on what they're experiencing, what they're going through. And you certainly exhibit and have spoken about all of them. And I take one at the end of these conversations and I try to sum up our, our conversation here. And for you, I think about effective intelligence and effective intelligence, you defined it so perfectly earlier that it's this the totality of your experiences that give you this lens by which to make decisions and conduct yourself physically, emotionally, mentally, and how you approach the world every day because you've had a set of experiences in the past that have shaped you. You have done that in so many different realms through the fashion industry, growing up in London, getting into modeling for the short time that it was and then transitioning into management and now really defining not only where we are in fashion over the last several decades, but where are we going? And being the person who really selects and defines what the face of not only the fashion industry is going to look like, but what are we as society gonna look like? What are the trends that we're gonna follow? That takes an incredible amount of all nine of these, but what you learn from your past and how you apply it to the future is so impactful and so important in this conversation. 
I thank you so much for spending time with us, inviting us to your home, talking about fashion in the heart of fashion, at least here in America, and sharing with us your lessons and making us better versions of ourselves than we walked in the door today. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you for listening. That was, that was excellent. <laughs> Yay! All right. Wow, that was a lot. You're good at that. No, that American Jedbergs went on to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Directorate of the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your creator and host, Fran Ricciopi. Join us next week for a new episode on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on YouTube for full episodes, highlights, and other behind-the-scenes content. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Ricciopi, Dallin Orger, and our sponsor, Jersey Mike Subs, on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As former members of Special Operations Forces, the Jedberg Podcast and Talent War Group contribute a percentage of all profits to Special Operations Warrior Foundation, supporting the families of our fallen warriors. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow.